Elden Ring. One of the most played games during its release that had a ton of players from both reviewers and players alike. The game took a different step from the Souls aspect formula, creating a more open world aspect of it and maintaining a certain level of challenge all throughout, branching out to a wider set of players while easing out the difficulty through various ways. As for me, to be honest, I'm not much of a fan for Souls myself. I've played a few of their games before, such as Bloodborne and Sekiro for example in the past, while the rest of it are mostly from Software's Armored Core series. I'm more of a fan for Armored Core to be honest. But Elden Ring on the other hand, I gave it a shot and managed to finish the whole game, spending most of my time exploring and unlocking some of the hidden secrets in the game and another two more sets of new games, each with different builds and a different kind of playstyle overall. Well, I did manage to play a bunch of Monster Hunter games in the past, and a few extra other ones at the side. At least I got a different kind of experience playing these kinds of games. This is K1PM. Today, I'll be doing a full review of Elden Ring. I'll be going more in depth about the game and pointing out the pros and the cons of it including the arguments that some people talks about, the graphics part, the story delivery, difficulty, and the other stuffs in the game. There would gonna be some spoilers in this video, however. Not much focus on the story, but some of the game's hidden contents. Elden Ring was developed by From Software and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment in February 25, 2022. With the help of George R. R. Martin for the writing and world building, Elden Ring had an overall interesting plot and managed to deliver an amazing introduction story that revolves around the shattering of Elden Ring and the flames of ambition, where a power struggle happened among them and a tarnish of no renown that would soon be the Elden Lord, as in the player itself a random person of whom the grace has chosen. Being a Tarnish with little to no strength at first, a maiden has set upon to guide the Tarnish throughout its journey, offering guidance and the deep stories of the lore, and empowerment with the use of the runes, as in turning the XP or gold into stat points, as well as her help on meeting the people at the round table hold. Smithing Master Hugh for the upgrading of weapons and ashes of war or weapon skills, Roderica for the improvement of summons, Brother Corin for the incantations, and a few important people in the story that could influence the player's ending in the end. The story along the way was really intriguing. The highlight moments of it were good, especially with the build up with the Radan Festival, that's arguably one of the most climactic scenes of it. While the ending of the game itself is kind of a bit short, but quite alright. It wraps it up properly depending on which of the quests has been completed and which side the player managed to choose in the end. As well as the dialogues and voices for each character sounds really good. It fits well with each of the characters' looks, namely with Rani, Alexander, and even little old Patches. That little bastard who'll try to kill you at the start and randomly shows up unexpectedly. But as much as I like the main parts of the story and even the little hints of what happened behind, like what happened with the story of Rogier, Dialos, or even with Aurelet, I find it troubling on how the delivery of the story kind of felt too separated. I hate it on how some of them can be really hard to track down without a proper guide, especially with the case of Alexander's quest around the world map. This might have managed to see a lot of the hidden story and places all throughout the world. I didn't fully understand what's happening in some parts of it. Like what happened with Blade for instance. Or even discover of what happened to brother Corin, for example. I wanted to pursue his story but I don't exactly know where he is by the time he left the round table hold and the chances of searching for him in a huge open world area can be really frustrating without a guide. What's worse, Brother Corin holds the key in getting a different ending. And without him, well, too bad. Now, I know what you might be thinking. If I just follow a guide online, there wouldn't be a problem, right? Well, I wanted to experience a game for my own without any guide, honestly. Just like playing Monster Hunter games out of my own experience. 
And that's not the only case with his quest. Alexander's case. Now that's a really hard to accomplish, especially if a player managed to explore most of the area and met Alexander at a later period of the game. I find it hard that a player would retrace their whole step just to look for Alexander at that point. Especially in an open world setting of a game. I mean, come on. And even there's the case with Rani's doll not spawning. If I haven't done the correct order for her quest, it's a bit frustrating that this can actually happen. Especially if that part of that specific uh, quest that I mentioned is I should go through this exact portal instead of going to a different route instead of going here. I understand that this is an intentional design. But this is an open world game. At least give us a sort of hints or clues of where a person would end up being in this case. Now there are some clues that I could look for like when I managed to get a key from Rani. I just simply check the key item itself and there's a guide on it. But for a lot of the other quests on the other hand, there's none. Even a simple journal would be helpful as not everyone would be able to track down every single quest that a player encounters. Especially after a long time of not playing the game again. Well, at least there's still a guide for the main story in a form of direction on a grace. So I'd give them that. At least players won't exactly get lost in the main parts of the game. Now the gameplay itself offers a variety of sets of styles in combat, on which a player could choose different sets over here along with a decent amount of customizability of a character. Later on, a set of two optional tutorials along the way, the player are free to explore and choose the kind of weapon to use. A player could go one-handed, two-handed, one-handed with a shield, one-handed with a scepter, dual-wield, dual-wield two-handed weapons, dual wield shields or even fist weapons, although the moves themselves are pretty much basic in a way. But on how to utilize those moves properly in a fight, what makes the game challenging in its own way? There are even consumables like bombs, perfumes, and throwable weapons that actually helps out the player greatly, along with the added customizable effects for a special set of potions to use, and how a coating of a weapon helps spices out the weapon greatly. Now what the game strives on the combat part is the attaining of different types of abilities, as in the magic spells and ashes of war or skills in a way, and even the incantations can really help. If it seems hard for some of the players to finish the game, summons what ends up making the game a lot more easier, and in some cases can actually be really broken as hell, especially with a mimic summon when equipping the right kind of gear. Although attaining them can be really tough, most of the equipments, Ashes of War, and the other stuffs are scattered around the whole map, either by gaining some of them in a boss fight or can be found in a specific hidden areas or events. Other weapons can be bought at a shop, and same thing with magic spells, incantations, and special dragon incantations. The different enemies and bosses are actually great on what they've done. I love how the main bosses can be really challenging. Each of them has their own set of different attacks and has a unique touch to them in defeating the player. Whether how confusing its delayed attacks can be or how annoying the boss's status infliction it deals. But for the other bosses in the game, it kind of feels too repetitive. How they add the same kind of enemy as a boss on different stages. Sometimes they'd even just make the bosses into two in a fight. I understand that they've done it this way since it is an open world game after all, but sometimes it just falls flat in those fights. As most of us know by now, Elden Ring is a really difficult game for many. And I understand that, even I had a rough start getting used to the controls and patterns of the bosses as I'm not used to the whole Souls-like aspect. Fighting Malenia and Radan was the hardest one I've beaten so far. It took me several tries just to beat them. But if I'd be honest with you, it's actually not that hard as to compare to its previous successors, like the other Souls game or close to that kind of difficulty and setting. 
I know it seemed impossible for a game like this to finish, but there's a lot of exploitable ways in defeating the different types of bosses. Sometimes, you just got to be creative, especially considering how huge the open world aspect of the game can be. Let's say if you're stuck fighting Market the Fell Omen, you know, the one in the castle thing. You could just go explore the area around first, level up a bit more, then beat him up later on. But of course, a player would still have to learn against the game's difficulty curve, just like the same thing with Monster Hunter games in a way. Not every person enjoys or get used to the same type of games after all. But at the very least, the game provides different means that makes each of the boss fights feels like a breeze at times. If you still find the game a bit hard in a way, multiplayer co-op would be your best friend. But it's both the blessing and a curse in a way. I like how there is a multiplayer setting for the game that seems very friendly when playing with a random player online. Doing a PvE in a ruin and help them eliminate the boss when they need it the most, it actually has a nice good thing in the game. But I hate it when it mostly only benefits the one asking for the help. The only reward that I end up getting is just these two and a fraction of the ruin's reward. It didn't actually let me accomplish a ruin in my world nor even gave me the actual loot from the ruin. It kind of feels counterintuitive that does happen in a multiplayer setting. Imagine if you're in a group of three playing a game. Each of you have to take turns in doing the ruin itself in order to complete it, making the game feel very long to accomplish. Because of that, it ends up becoming tedious playing the game with friends or with other people, right? I understand that if it's a quest related to the story itself, but it's a different case, right? It's just an exploration of a dungeon or something. And I haven't even mentioned the other limitations in the co-op aspect. For an open world game with a multiplayer setting, I'm kind of wondering why they end up creating borders within different sections in the map. As if it weren't enough that I can't even ride a single mount in that open field. Or even camp at the grace for a bit just to replenish my health and potions. Or how there's a chance of a player invading your world all of a sudden. This can be turned off at least when playing alone, but when playing with a friend, it's forced. Not every player wants the forced PvP experience, especially if cheaters still exist and a few trolls keeps on invading. Some players won't even fight at all, and others would try to waste your time. This kinda ruins the whole multiplayer aspect of the game. The experience of it, I mean especially in an open world kind of game. Luckily, that didn't happen to me. But the other videos and streams I watch? Man, it feels like a bummer playing the game with that kind of feeling. Considering there's a lot of equipments to discover that a player could test out, a player has to upgrade them in order to progress much more easier in the game. In a way, it actually forces the player to choose the kind of equipment at the start much more early instead of giving the player a chance to try and test out the different types of weapons available at the start. The materials needed for the upgrades are not that many to find. Considering a player has to collect specific levels of materials that can mostly find within the caves or those cracked statues in the game. And it's not that much, honestly. Well, at least that's what happened in my blind playthrough. No farming or grinding, just naturally exploring each of the places and start looting the area. I was thinking of switching to a different weapon along the way, but it's kinda hard to do it, since I couldn't properly upgrade my weapons correctly. I understand that there's those spells that you could collect and give it to this being, in order to broaden its shop to buy more stuffs around, but it's kinda hard to collect them all without a guide for the game, especially if those spells only provide a specific set of material upgrades. It takes a really long time to get there. The game encourages the player to explore more into the world after all. But what I hate the most is that you gotta collect them all over again when a player goes for a new game plus. I understand if the Grace were the ones that had a reset, but the bells part? That's just annoying. Luckily however, the game finally patched this one out on the 1.05 patch. Although it kinda sucks how the ones who played that game before that patch had to experience that kind of frustration. When it comes to the game's art style of the graphics part of it, I'd say it's actually decent overall. It may not be the best in some parts of the game, but it is an open world game after all. 
What's important here the most is the world building aspect of it. I love how most of the stages looks amazing for that kind of way. From the games designed with the castle, the main capital, to the areas in the academy and even in the underworld below. Although I have to be honest, not all of the places are that good. The regular caves and ruins aren't that special and that's alright. But what worries me the most is the platforming side of it. Especially if you end up reaching to this secret area, you'll understand what I mean. Or how there's still some bugs when it comes to the platforming side of things. That these kind of bugs do happen from time to time in the game. But not always, just sometimes. The colors might look washed out or dry as the others say. But when you get to reach to the other parts of the game, it's actually not that bad. It might look that way, but it's an intentional part for the design, which I actually like. I appreciate how dead it feels on some of its places. It's kind of like how Fallout games do with the game's overall look. Or even that We Happy Few one, how the environment changes a lot depending on the player's current state. If it matches the game that well, well, it's not that bad, honestly. Now the soundtrack of the game, I'd say it's decent. It focuses a lot more on the atmosphere of the game that builds up for each of the places. From Volcano Manor's menacing theme looming around the corner, to the mystifying feeling within the academy. When it comes to the boss's themes however, it's absolutely amazing to hear them during in a fight that escalates every match to be really intense that heightens the feel of the battle. Like that one theme fighting against Godfrey's apparition, I had that sudden chills just hearing from it. Although that boss was fairly too easy to beat in terms of its moves, honestly. Wish they could just at least make it a bit more harder to beat. That's why I give this game a rating of 8.6 out of 10. The game is actually great at its current state. The well-developed world building and story, challenging bosses, along with its vast selection of weapons and abilities, what makes the game memorable with its own different take to it. In some areas, it does fall short a bit, such as the part where the quests are harder to keep track on without a sort of journal for the player. I understand that From Software aims for a more immersive kind of feel to it, and I actually appreciate how they've set it up, even the little things like the UI part, and the small touches behind a place that tells a story in a hidden kind of way. But it felt like it lacks a bit of conveniency for the quests part. Although what really feels like a letdown a bit is how awful the multiplayer mechanics are set. With the whole limitation of the area, non-rideable mount, no specific rewards and progression for the other friend, and the forced PvP when playing with friends along, it felt like they hadn't thought about it that well, especially in an open world kind of setting for a game. I'm not that a huge fan for the whole Souls-like aspect of a game, but surprisingly, I actually enjoyed it. I didn't even expect I'd last that long enough to even play a third time of it. Now would I recommend you on the game? If you're more into the open world aspect with a more reasonable challenge of it, while having a keen interest on the mysterious and hidden aspects of parts of the story, Elden Ring is an amazing game to try out. That's absolutely much more friendly compared to the usual Souls game format. But if you're trying to play it as a multiplayer kind of setup, I'd rather avoid that part since it's not that great as it is. I suggest try getting a mod for it instead just to have a better experience of it. Removing the whole boundary, no horse thing, no camping, etc. part of it. Although beware of using mods though as it can possibly ban you from the game. If you haven't tried playing these type of games before, the learning curve of it can be really hard though. It might test your patience a bit too much. I suggest just go for the other type of games first before going to this one. For more videos such as these, why not head down to my channel to check things out? I do accurate game reviews of the past games, and some other new ones too. If you consider subscribing to my channel, please do follow me on my Twitter account for more updates. In case something bad might happen all of a sudden, there's still a way to contact me over there. This is K1PM, and I bid you farewell.